Yeah, exactly. I don't even know if I'm muted. No, you guys are. We're 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 good. We're here. So, um, are we are we live? Not yet. We are. Oh, here we go. So we're going to turn our volumes off on the YouTube thing if we're watching back on that and go into Zoom. Hey, guys, how you doing? Thank you for tuning in. Uh, welcome back to the long lockdown. I was saying to these guys, I feel increasingly like a talk show host. And uh, yeah, I'll be doing all kinds of strange uh, talk show bits throughout this chat. I'm joined by three amazing writers that I wanted to bring on today and talk about the theme of home and what it means to you, maybe literally, but also just in your work, what does it mean? Um, a lot of us with kind of complex identities, we always seem to be searching for home and where do we belong? And right now with so many of us who are lucky enough to have a home or at home, there would be a good chance to talk about it. So over here got Nika Shukla, um, Fatima Bhutto and Rupi Kaur. And um, guys, I guess I'll just start off by asking you, um, where is home for you? Rupi. Yes. Okay. Um, home. I, I feel like for me, the first time I kind of answered that question, I had a talk to do and they asked me, where is home? And at that moment, I was kind of moving around all over the place and I just couldn't figure out where home was physically. And Fatima, I feel like I've spoken to you about this. Mm -hmm. I feel like I don't, I'm not connected to a physical place when it comes to home. Maybe because I was born in a different country. My dad's a refugee. I'm an immigrant. And we've moved a ton growing up. And now my work makes me like, I'm constantly moving and living out of a suitcase. And so home is really kind of become and has maybe always been a state of mind and always trying to make sure my mind and body are connected. And when they're connected, no matter where I am, I feel home. Wow, amazing. Amazing. Well, I want to chat to you in a bit about how you kind of get to that place of feeling at home, feeling at home in your own skin later, and particularly with everything that's going on right now. Um, Fatima, what about you? Is this, is this a question that you've been asked? Is this a question you ask yourself a lot, either in yeah. your work or in your mind? Yeah, it's, um, it's quite a bit of what Rupi said. I was, I was born in Afghanistan. I grew up in Damascus, Syria. I'm from Pakistan. So I, I grew up in Karachi, but it wasn't until I was older that we returned home. And so home for me has always been a very romantic idea. It's a place of, of longing and, and a place of imagination more than of being anywhere. And as, as a kind of rootless person, that idea of where you are meant to be versus where you are is something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about personally but but also writing about and I I think actually for me home is not one place home is where people you love are and those people are always going to be scattered and so we mm. live scattered lives and and we have to imagine things in a scattered way I love that I love that I also love the idea that you're just touching on about this idea that um the space that home occupies for you in your mind and in your writing isn't uh, the place that you are or a place that you ever reach it's a place you're always seeking so I guess yeah. it's that kind of Sufi idea of always you know being the seeker of yeah. the journey itself being um the focus rather than ever getting there uh, so that's that's interesting I'm going to come back to that as well in a minute Nikesh what about you please just say just the one word answer like Harold <laughs> <laughs> after that uh well the, yeah well you know it's that hip-hop adage of it's not where you're from it's where you're at like I, I live in Bristol um I'm you grew up in London and there's there is this thing about grief you know my mum my passed away 10 years ago this year and, and I often think that grief um often freezes you freezes your relationship at the point at which you la you last had a, a, a moment of intimacy together and so I feel like home for me is London in October 2011, which is when I moved mm. out of London. And it was like those dying days that I was I was living there, and I was no, I knew I was about to leave, but I was sort of walking around this with you know with those sort of tear stained eyes, going like, take a mental picture. This is going to be the last time you you experience this. And then you know every time I go back to London now, it feels like a place that 
belongs to other people now. I don't I don't live there. Um, so for home for me is London 2011, late 2011. Great. I'm already crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, thank you. I mean, that's beautiful. It's kind of interesting, though, in, in what every, I mean, none of you guys are tying your sense of home to a place. Um, and I and I guess and particularly with like Nikesh and Fatima, for you, home is a place that you can never get to in the way that you're defining it. You seem to have kind of made peace with that definition and actually redefined the whole concept of home as somewhere that you're not ever meant to get to. It's somewhere in your past for you, Nikesh, or it's somewhere abstract for you, um, Fatima, and it's the kind of journey of seeking it yeah. that, that is the focus. Is it that journey of seeking home that kind of animates your writing and your fiction? Because for me, I always feel that Home is a place that we build through fiction. Home mm. is a place that we make through art. And in some ways, do you feel like that's what you're doing? I mean, even you, Rupi, were saying it's when your mind and body feel in sync. I've seen the way you perform and the way you perform and the way you recite your poetry is so physical. It feels like your mind and your body are in sync. Is, is writing, is fiction um, an act of kind of trying to create a home? And if, and if it is, is that a home for you or is it also for, for others? Right. I mean, I think what's interesting is, you know, we were chatting off camera um, about the fact that we're all Desi, so our relationship to time is abstract and unusual. And I think in a way, maybe space too. I mean, for me, fiction, fiction is the place where I, where I can put home down. So, I mean, The Runaways was a novel really about where one belongs and the seductions of belonging and where we feel welcome. And those places might not be the right places or the safe places or the places we grew up in. They might be turbulent terrain, but, but we seek them out because we want so desperately to be somewhere. Um, and so I think for me as a writer, I don't know if Nikesh and, and Ruby feel this way, writing fiction is the one place where I can have a one word answer to your question. Whereas in life, as Nikesh said, life, you know, the Karachi of 1993 when I moved there is not the Karachi of 2020 or 19 or it's not even the Karachi of yesterday. It changes so much. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I find I find that um, sort of pe people's um, sort of creations of, of home and how they how they depict home often <sighs> often sort of make, uh, spin me off into different directions, trying to recreate something in my own in my own practice you know and you know segue into the, the long goodbye but you know watching that short film and watching the first act of, of the short film I, I kind of felt this strange nostalgia for um for my childhood home in a, in a really visceral way that I hadn't felt before like you know the, the overlapping conversations the television mm. constantly on like stuff everywhere and then you move stuff from one room but you then have to fit mm. into another room where there's <laughs> stuff everywhere and I, I could smell the like the oh the, god the, the seeds. and it was it was so visceral and you know what I've been planning a novel for the last year I knew exactly what it was going to be I had it down to a T and I watched I watched the long goodbye and I was like you know what I feel brave enough to write about about home in a way that I've not been I've been sort of running away from in a really long time and I just I junked this thing that I was ready to work on and just started <laughs> writing something really naturalistically but in this way that I just really wanted to capture my that thing that you'd kind of awoken in me segue into <laughs> the long goodbye oh thank you man wow that's amazing I'm glad glad it had that impact it's weird isn't it it's when we kind of see those realities reflected it kind of emboldens us to also kind of speak about them. It kind of emboldens us to say, okay, so it does matter. That experience mm -hmm. does count. It is mm -hmm. a valid space to explore, which is um, which can be kind of tricky if you don't see yourself reflected back in the culture, right? Mm -hmm. You often aren't sure whether anyone cares about that experience or if it's, you know, you should be exploring that or not. Um, right. I just want to touch on what you, you had something to say a moment ago, Rupi, right? When we were talking about whether is, is home what you're trying to kind of build through fiction? Is that For what sure. animates you? Is it that journey or is, or are you just at peace with, with the home question and it's, and it's other things? What role I, does it play? Well, I think that I didn't mean to do it this way, but um, 
in search of finding home, what my identity meant, I think I ended up finding my voice. So when I started performing, I was performing. I was lost. I was confused. I'd like hit rock bottom. It was like a really bad time in my life. I was 17 or 16 and I just didn't have any support around me in terms of family and friends. And so it was that feeling of walking up to a microphone, I don't know, and just hearing my voice and feeling heard for the first time. That is when I feel most at home. And I so often say that I feel so at home on the stage. And for some reason over the last couple of years, I've felt so separated from my body, maybe because life has just become so turbulent that I just feel like my mind and my body are disconnected and I'm working on that. But the moments where I feel like the two do come together is on that stage. That's when I'm most present. And I was laughing when Fatima was speaking earlier because this past summer I was having a conversation with her because I was been struggling with the idea of home so much. And I asked her because I know she also lives between two places. And <laughs> I always ask her these ridiculous questions. So I'm like, she has the answers. I know she does. And I asked her, I was like, so where do you feel more at home? Is it London or is it Karachi? And she just looked at me and she's like, I always feel home at the place that I left behind. So you're always longing for the place you left behind. And I just threw up my hands and I was like, damn it. All right, fine. Mm. Um, which was a, a, I can relate to that because I feel like she put words to the experience I was having. It was a little bit sad but it was also comforting. So mm. now I think about that when I'm homesick and it helps me just feel a little bit more at ease. Mm. I love this idea actually of, of the, the you introduced Fatima um, of home being a feeling of longing. Yeah. Right. It's not something you ever necessarily arrive at, but it's something you're always kind of seeking either in your past, as you said, Nikesh, or the place you just left behind or something you're seeking on stage. Um, I guess that kind of speaks a lot to this idea of heartbreak, mm. isn't it? If home is a kind of heartbreak, I mean, or a, or a nostalgia, right? Mm. I mean, the Long Goodbye album is kind of framing this um, relationship with Britain or relationship with country with the country that you call home as a, as a heartbreak. And so I guess I'm just wondering if if home is something in the past, if home is something that you never quite get to, is home also that feeling of, of heartbreak? Um, can you relate to that feeling that I kind of explore in the long goodbye of feeling like you're going through a breakup with your home, with your home country or where, you know, the place or the people that, that you grew up with? Um, because it seems under your definition, Fatima, that's, that's kind of standard. Home is always a heartbreak. <laughs> Whereas the way I was trying to flame, frame it in the, ang in, in the album was this idea of, okay, this is heartbreaking because mm. I'm being kicked out of my home, mm. you know, mm. or the place that, I've, that I call home or that I thought was yeah. my home. So is, is your, what's your take on this, Fatima? Am I just late to the party and it's, it's always going to be a heartbreak? <laughs> no, or, I think, or what's the deal? I, I think, and I don't know if you feel this way, but I, I think that when we talk about love and the things we love, that can't just be one thing. It's not one static mm. thing, but it, that has within it intense beauty and intense wonder and amazement and joy, but it, it has to include heartbreak and, and pain. And, and for me, the notion of home always did include heartbreak because I grew up in exile. And, and so as a young child, I, I, I would ask, why are we not home? You know, I grew up in Syria, I thought, for a long time that I was Syrian and my father was at great pains to remind me constantly that I, I wasn't. And, and every time he succeeded, he would then have to answer the other question, which was, well, why can't I be where I'm really supposed to be? You know, why can't I be where I belong? And that's going to include some pain in it. And that's going to include some sadness. But I was thinking about you, Riz, and I, I wonder if there is a moment, there is a moment where you felt your heart break with your country, because I think I think there can be moments where you feel you don't recognize a place anymore. And then I also think it's mad to expect that a place should be recognizable at all times, mm -hmm. that, it, that it will, of course, turn on you and betray you and wound you mm. like any other living thing 
might, no? Like any relationship, right? Yeah. It has those kind of ups and downs. But I guess it'll only be a heartbreak if you care about it, if you do feel some attachment and some investment to that place. I mean, how have, how have you guys, I mean, just to answer your question, if there was a particular moment, I don't know if you guys have felt this as well. If, I'd love to hear if there was a particular moment for you when you were like, actually, we need to kind of discuss this relationship. Mm. Um, you know, we need to kind of have have that conversation. <clears throat> for me, I think it was around kind of 2016 with the election of Trump and also Brexit. I kind of found myself in rooms full of, you know, perfectly well-adjusted, successful people, different ethnic groups who are saying, I don't know if I should stay in the US. I don't know if I should stay in the UK, even though I'm born here. I'm not sure if I should have kids here or grandkids. Mm -hmm. By the time it gets to my grandkids, will it still be safe here? You know, for people like me who look like me, who have my religion. And I thought that was, that was heartbreaking. First, because I'd never heard people talk like that. Secondly, because I really recognized that as a thought that I'd had as well. And so I wanted to explore that and explore that as a kind of heartbreak. Um, but I guess, what you know, to your point, Fatima, every relationship shifts. Every relationship has these ruptures. And every home and every relationship in some small way will break your heart. So how have you guys dealt with your home countries or the places where you're from kind of breaking your heart? Have you had that experience? And, and how have you kind of worked through it? Have, have you kind of redefined your sense of identity from it? I feel like, well, I feel like the both are true for me. Like the kind of experience that you're describing as a heartbreak, Riz, and then this how Fatima describes home as well. Like both can be true at one time. Like I'm saying home is a state of mind, but I also really want to buy a house mm -hmm. and like, make it wonderful and feel comfortable for me. And so it's like, I'm pursuing and I'm believing both of those things to be true and alive at once. And so, I mean, I'm from, I'm in Canada right now and that's where I was raised. And so I feel like it's a little bit, there hasn't been that breakup moment, but I think the moment that I felt like, oh, I'm different is, probably post 9-11 because we got a lot of you know the hate and the xenophobia also like came up here and my dad who is a truck driver and he's a turban bearded man and so to see his relationship shift with his work and him coming home and talking about where was safe to sleep where was not where was safe to pull over and where was not and then constantly like before that we didn't really hear stories about the violence it was more so just like oh yes we're here and then there's racism and then a couple of other things but then it was just like we were under a microscope and so I think that was when I first started to feel like wow we're really really othered and what does that mean mm -hmm. and that tied into your sense of like actually maybe home is a shifting idea maybe belonging is something that I have to find inside myself through my performance right. through my voice because <clears throat> you go back home and it's not the it, you know it's not the place that your parents described to you like mm -hmm. I went back I moved here when I was four and then I couldn't go back home till I was in eighth grade so I don't know maybe I'm gonna say 13 years old and so I was like where the hell are we like hello you spent 13 years telling me home was like this like this like that and this is like nothing like how you described it. And it was because my parents were stuck in the year that they left and romanticizing that and holding on to that as a way to just survive. And so we all showed up in like my dad's village, confused as hell. And hmm. so I always try to keep that in mind too. Just home is totally so romanticized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of inspiring, actually, to hear, like, you know, all you guys are really successful at what you do as writers and you build these worlds and you've got these voices. And it's kind of comforting to hear that for all of you guys, the idea of where home is completely like, it's like, well, how long have you got? You know what I mean? Like, where do you want me to start? It's It's somewhere that I kind of deliberately define as residing inside myself and it comes and goes depending on how in my body I feel or it's somewhere in my past that I can never get back 
what I can tap into if I really close my eyes and put on the right tune and smell the right smells at my aunt's house or it's somewhere that I'm never supposed to get to. And the whole act of making work is kind of seeking it out. That's kind of amazing because in a way it's that disconnection from home or that searching for home that kind of seems to be creating and guiding so much of your work. Um, and, and I would say kind of is what leads to such amazing work from people with complex identities or, you know, with a, with a complex answer to this question. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about how you feel your relationship to belonging or home or um, has shifted with this moment, with everything that we're living through right now. Um, I, I kind of wanted to just touch on this point, like, you know, over the last few years, as I said, kind of particularly with about 2016 or so, I really felt like I had to, I thought visibility is not enough. You know, people have to be vocal as well about their values in the face of all this rising intolerance and othering, as you put it, Rupi. And so, you know, I started off Sweatshop Boys um, and we did that. And I just kind of found myself, whereas before I was maybe bite my tongue a little bit, not a great deal, but a little bit. Now I, I kind of stopped doing that altogether. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I kind of felt like, I'm not a believer in tribalism at all, right? Um, I don't believe that the goal is like my team, people who look like me, who have names like me, who have my faith or whatever, need to end up on top. I just believe in kind of equality. And sometimes you have to kind of get into the the vehicle of your identity, right? Mm. In order to help level that playing field. I kind of feel like after Corona, I wonder what role identity politics will play. I kind of wonder if it will be even more relevant than ever or whether it will become less and less relevant to those of us who want an equal society because I remember people would say, you know what, racism won't end until we have an alien invasion. Mm. I mean, I'd like to believe that's true. I don't know if it is. and We can talk about that. But Corona feels like the alien invasion, right? It feels like that thing that's reminded us all we're just all human. It's a great equalizer no matter where we come from. Do you feel like your work or how you kind of engage with your identity and stuff might really shift after this? Or what do you foresee around some of the conversations that, that you know, you talk about in your work kind of I- evolving after this? Has it crossed your mind or? Yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot in the last couple of weeks about who I'm writing for and at what moment. And I think the thing that, the thing that fiction gives me is clarity. And the thing that prose gives me is um, a method of interrogation. And I, I think I've just spent the last week working out that everything everything I write doesn't need to have an audience. I don't need to write to kind of put it out into the world. Sometimes I can just look within and that's okay. And I've been thinking a lot more about just sitting with, sitting with my feelings a lot more and um, writing stuff just just for me just to kind of give myself some sort of clarity and some sort of inter- interrogation into how I'm doing and that's okay that doesn't need to see the light of day I think I think there's been so much of this sort of um weird like hustle culture versus I just want to sit stare into space culture going on online and it's okay to do both and that's what I've been thinking about a lot like it's I'm not gonna be working on stuff that I'm gonna write the novel I've always wanted to write and I'm gonna sell it for millions and millions of pounds and whatnot I I can just sit with my feelings and that's all right I haven't felt like that for a long time Mm. Mm. yeah what about you guys yeah how you feel how do you feel your work might respond to this moment Uh, has it already started doing that or are you still processing like where's your head at because I I feel that that kind of yo-yoing as well Nikesh I feel like you know what I want to stay connected I want to stay engaged I want to kind of convene these conversations I want to start writing and I also kind of feel like man I just want to like hibernate and curl up and go what the hell is happening you know um and and I do wonder how my work will change from this I think all of our work will probably change from this in ways you probably don't understand but yeah I don't know how I'd be interested in hearing how because you had to cancel tour and everything, how you're envisioning that or maybe changing it moving forward. But um, back to your other question. Well, I was in the process of, I've been in the process of writing my third book, which the deadline is fast approaching. And so I 
these months were supposed to be like the moments where I'm finishing it up. <laughs> and so I had all of these like elaborate plans of where, what sunny destination am I going to go to to finish this thing that's kicking my ass? And the world is so funny because, you know, it just ended up full circle. Like this is a house that I left to start off this journey of mine. And this is like now where I ended back. This is where I ended up. This is the last place I wanted to write this book. And so, you know, with like my parents off and fighting in that corner and then a sibling doing this and blah, 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 and the neighbors losing their mind. And so it's just really funny to me. And so actually it's, I've been doing a lot of that yo-yoing too. And I'm actually a little bit grateful and I'm just sinking into the irritation and the annoyance and the joy and all of the emotions that come with that yo-yoing because I don't know, I just realized there's probably never going to be another opportunity in my life where the six of us come together like this ever again, ever. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of been the silver lining of it. And so I'm still trying to finish the book. It's actually interesting because I'm writing the book, the chapter I'm working on right now is about loneliness. It is about that fear. It's about all the things that I think a lot of us are feeling. So it's easier to tap into for sure. Mm. Hmm. Well, I remember once, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, Fatima. no, go ahead. Well, I just remember once, Rupi, I asked you, like, who are you writing for? Do you have a clear idea who you're writing for? And I remember we kind of were having a chat, this chat over dinner once. Yeah. And you were like, and you had, I remember you had a very specific answer to that question. And I just wonder, I mean, it doesn't have to be an a, a answer that you share. It may just be something that privately guides you. But do you feel like that might shift or that might evolve in the wake of this? this lightning bolt that has reminded us yeah. that we are all the same and we're all in it together. I, or does, will this lightning bolt will probably affect different people in different ways. So it's still about, you know, seeking out. It, yeah. I think it's made it more clear for me. Like I started to write for myself as a form of medicine to try to process the experiences I had in life. And then what happened was somehow I ended up publishing the book and then I, had this like audience and throughout that time I was like you know you have to make sure that you stay true to yourself and you're writing for you blah 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 but I couldn't stop the people from coming in even though I thought I was doing a really good job of it they had broken down the doors and the gates and whether I like to admit it or not I mean now I realize it but I had suddenly stopped writing for myself and mm. now I was writing for the people at I'm writing for my publishers. I'm writing for my team, my manager. I'm writing for the people who are constantly like, where's book three? Where's book three? Where's book three? And so I think who I'm writing for just became clear because I know I've been trying to write for myself, but it's so hard in a busy world where there's so many expectations. And now that the world has stopped and there's a moment of pause and stillness, I'm forced to come back to myself. And so a couple of days ago, I was having a total messy breakdown and I was on a call, it was a Zoom call with a bunch of other artists and they were just like, when was the last time you felt happy writing? Like you really, really just enjoyed it 100%. And I told them, I was like, the last time I felt a lot of joy writing was before I got published, which was five years ago. Wow. And Shiva said, okay. So I want you to just take a second. You've been doing these, this workshop and I gave on um, IG live, I gave everybody this prompt to write a letter. And she's like, I want you to use your own prompt and write a letter to yourself from 2014 before you publish. And it's been like one of the most therapeutic things that I've done. And I'm just trying to remember that every day. So who I'm writing for has become more clear. It hasn't, it's just changed back to, who I was supposed to be writing for. And I hope that doesn't shift because so easily without us realizing it, it can shift because the external world sort of takes over. Amazing. So beautifully said. Yeah, I'm sure we can all relate to that, can't we? Is that sense of other people entering your creative process or second guessing their reactions and responses? How, how do you guys deal with that? Fatima, how, how do you, yeah. Well, I wanted to touch on something Rupi said and something you said, Riz. I think, you know, writing, I don't know if you go through this when you're working on your albums, but 
or uh, Nikesh, I wonder if you and Rabiul agree with me, but it is a lonely occupation. It's a solitary occupation. So for a lot of us whose job is to sit in a room quietly for seven hours a day, I feel lucky to be able to continue my work in the middle of this strange and surreal moment. But then to go back to what you said earlier, Riz, about identity, I think it's so interesting that you wanted us to talk about home. And especially at this moment where it seems that half of us are divided between people who are lucky enough to be at home um, and the other half who just aren't. You know, we, we're talking also about countries like India, like Pakistan, where this pandemic is presenting itself in unusual ways and new ways. So we're not just seeing people wonder how they're gonna stay sane at home, but we also see migrant communities, migrant workers, subsistence workers, daily wage workers who just don't have the luxury to be at home or who cannot be at home. And how this moment has forced all of us, I hope, to think about others, to think about people who are incarcerated. I mean, it's, it's, it's something I think about because I can't remember the last time anyone else had to collectively think about prison populations because the population um, at risk now affects all of us, which should be the case in healthy times. Exactly. Um, but but just never is, you know. And so we've seen, you know, countries like Iran, like I think Jordan, even they've released prisoners in Pakistan. A lot of provincial courts have given orders to release prisoners, but the Supreme Court just stopped that. Um, and people are talking about it. And I kind of wonder why we waited for this to talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. why did we just clung to our identities for so long when isn't the thing to do to drop them, to just be a million identities at once, which is what we are anyway. Yeah, and I saw there was some conversation right now about Rikers Island prison in, in New York, which I kind of researched a lot for the night of, and there's a conversation happening there about mm -hmm. whether inmates should be released or not. A lot of people in Rikers are actually awaiting trials. They haven't been That's found right. guilty of anything. Um, so, but in a way, kind of what you're saying is that, well, at least what I'm kind of taking from what you're saying is that what's happening right now with Corona reminds us that we're all the same. We're all in it together. We all need to think about each other, but also the circumstances of what's happening are really showing that actually we're not all in the same boat at all. It's really kind of throwing up the inequalities in our society in a, in a crazy way. Right. And something that I'm worried about is how after this, yeah. you know, um, what kind of world will we be in? Will we be in a world that is more equal or more unequal? You know, as I said, a world of closed borders or a world of we're all in it together. I feel um, like people have become complacent. Like right now, everyone's like, it's easy for us to say, oh, we're all in it together. We're all in it together. But then the moment things go back to the way that they were and we're comfortable in our lives again, we just become complacent. Yeah. And so how do, how do you not become complacent? How do you make sure that people remember? Mm -hmm. It's a good it's a good thing to remember this moment where we require everyone to be well in order for us to be well. I mean, I I agree with you, Rupi. I'm slightly terrified that the moment this is over, everyone will forget. And we'll just go back to looking inward. But that, that is that is the fundamental, isn't it? like our well-being is interconnected our well-being is something that we have to kind of calculate holistically it's not just about my mm. well-being it's about we are one organism you know um yeah. but i don't know if we will be able to forget this anytime soon to me this feels like the kind of event that's like a world you know world war ii scale event you know the whole world is going through this together i think that that you know what's going to happen to our economies and you know mm. the lives that may be lost I think this is one of those moments where we're going to kind of reimagine certain aspects of, of society. Um, and I guess, yeah, like in the face of all that, it can sometimes feel a bit daunting about like, what the hell is our role in that? You know, what the hell is me sitting in my room writing have to do with that? Or is it actually an absolutely essential part of it? If kind of what you've been saying is, you know, through your pens, what you're doing is you're creating home. Is, is not, is possibly is now the moment where we can really dream up a home through the pen, where we can co-create a vision of what the future can look like. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Right. 
Well, I think what this has shown us is how like fickle capitalism really is. And so clearly it didn't work. It didn't, doesn't work. So are we going to go back to how things were? I don't think the world can. So I agree with you on that. But then what does the next thing look like? And I think that's really interesting as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been thinking a lot about how this is helping me to be more present. And I think being present has been something that I've really struggled with for the last few years when it comes to like, you know, thinking about, oh, I've got to get this done. I've got to be in this place. I've got to, you know, working to, to do X, Y, and Z, but you know, I've got two, two kids and um, having this opportunity to build a relationship with them is really, really incredible at the moment because I get to be present with them. And that for me has been a real eye opener. Um, I've been thinking less, I've been worrying less about the future and not, and worrying less about the past and actually just being in the moment of being with mm. those two people because that that moment then is all that matters to them you know so it should be it should be the only thing that matters to me in that moment that's beautiful Nikesh. That beautiful are you homeschooling your kids Nikesh? yeah yeah we, we are we we get um stuff from from the from the school that you know we we go through um and we're kind of also you know today i we took them on a, a a virtual trip of new to new york to kind of you know because you know all these, all these websites that are uh, opening up their digital doors to kind of show different exhibitions and stuff and so we we kind of curated a, a day a day out in in new york which was quite fun that's um, so nice and you know one thing while we were concentrating on the space of having to exist in the space, we can take those opportunities to, to go on flights of whimsy and, you know, utilize our imagination. And that, and that's kind of the fun thing about being a writer is that I get to, I get to use my imagination in ways I haven't in a really long time that, you know, the mm. idea of play is, is really mm. interesting. Yes. I agree. Yeah. I've been trying to like, because I get so trapped in work, 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 go, 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 thinking about the future um, and the hustle culture that I have been trying for a long time to like escape that and have more moments to play. And this is definitely, this definitely helps because there's many moments when there's nothing to do except, you know, open up an old box of, you know, old art supplies that I haven't touched in years or old books. And so, yeah. No, but that is, isn't that a great lesson? I mean, because that's essentially the only way to survive anything is to focus on the moment and, and to be there for what's happening then and to take everything day by day. I think, again, it's one has to keep saying how lucky we are to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And there's an incredible right. privilege and we're incredibly fortunate to, to go day by day. Um, but it does feel... It does feel like a strange pause, doesn't it, in some way? And yeah. I, I really hope we're able to sustain it. Although I kind of feel like I'm still doing what I always did in a way, which was to same. spend seven hours alone a day. <laughs> yes, I feel like this is the same. I'm like, I realize I socially distance all the time, except yeah. now I'm upset about it because they, somebody's telling me I can't go out. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know this is flippant, but the last two weeks have really done I've, I've really shown a lot of people in various creative industries that a lot of meetings could just be emails yeah and they can be done on the phone and that's that's been interesting but um a bit, do, do you do you guys have a routine like are you trying to stick to a routine at the moment or are you um are you just sort of taking each day as it comes man i struggled for the first um, little bit it just felt like everything was soup you know when the future feels like it's foggy then you, it's harder to make sense of the present and so I wasn't really sure exactly how I can help what I can do turn out the way we can help is by just staying home um, you know maybe trying to provide some distraction some connection for people and now I've come up with an absolutely come on, come on. insane um, um kind of routine kind of routine tell us about it stick to like stick to 
like oh I've got an echo there. Are you guys hear there? Are you guys yeah. hearing that? Yeah. Yeah, I like how yeah. we have like four like writers trying to figure out technology that's never gonna work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, here we go, it's gone. So um yeah, I mean so basically now I'm just like getting up at eight, um, trying to like just get my head right, trying to meditate. I'm really bad at sitting still, so I'm trying to get better at that. So I'm trying to do a bit of that. Um, try and do some creative work from nine till 12 and at 12 I work out um, with a friend yeah. on on Skype or whatever and having someone else there yeah. to bounce off and to just push you is just it's, it's really the highlight of my day really just getting to kind of move around um, yeah then I'll have lunch and in the afternoons for for emails and stuff I'm supposed to meditate again at four I don't do that that never happens. <laughs> what really happens, that's what's supposed to happen. What really happens is I have a bit of lunch, I get my phone out and I go down a kind of news wormhole or a social media wormhole. And then I feel kind of anxious and then maybe uh. I'll call someone. And then you're worried about family and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And really, I guess the before I'll be able to stick to any proper routine, I'm trying to just put my phone down a little bit. Mm. It's crazy. It's like that's the only kind of connection a lot of us yeah. have got now. I'm on my phone more than I've been Ever in a been. very long time. Yeah. I feel like it's the last thing that the planet that humans needed, right? Was a push towards living more on their phones and not meeting yeah. up as much. And I like feel like opposite. this virus is going to make it worse because now all these, I feel like industries and corporations are going to figure out, find out ways for us to like to only be on, on it more in case something like this happens again. I know we're not trying to stay on the, our phones, but can I just say, if you are on your phones, um, then it would be great if you check out this series that we're doing, which Ruby's been a part of and Nikesh is going to be a part yes. of next week. Talk about it, man. It's amazing. Please, um, Atama, what's up? So Sana Meher is another uh, Karachi writer, and she wrote this incredible book called A Woman Like Her. Um, which is about Kandil Baloch and it's about honor killing and celebrity and virality in, in Pakistan. And Sanam had a bunch of events lined up for that book now. And I am supposed to be on a Runaways paperback tour, which is about a bunch of people who run away to join ISIS. So these are all like really uplifting topics that I don't think anyone wants to talk about during Corona. But we found ourselves kind of stranded and we were thinking, you know, this has happened to us, what's happening to a lot of younger writers, to writers who maybe are coming out with debut books or, you know, who worked on projects for years and now they find themselves drowned under this CNN news wave. And also we were wondering about loneliness and what do people do when maybe they don't have people to check in with? And so we reached out to um, a whole bunch of writers who we love and who we read and who we're curious about, and including Rupi and, and Nikesh, and, and asked them to read to us, to just make small videos where they read to us for three minutes, either from their own books or from books they love or from both. And we're sharing those online. So our screen time is really like, it's out of control, but it's called Stay Home, Stay Reading. And you can find it through the hashtag on Instagram and we were trying to convince Riz, but maybe you can do like some of your, some of your music or some of your. Well, you know, that's one thing that I have to admit is I've always had, I've always, I've never really been a massive reader. I've yeah. just never developed the habit. I always found it hard to sit still. I always had quite a bit of like kind of ADD going on. And um, I was kind of, you know, I did well at school, but I didn't, I just the act of sitting down to read is something mm. that um, I've never made part of my my daily routine and my and my life. If I always felt like if I'm sitting down, I should be writing. I should be writing lyrics or yeah. making something rather than absorbing. And it's something that I'm just kind of trying to turn the corner towards more now. So actually, maybe that should be my kind of Corona commitment, yeah. you know, to myself <laughs> is read, man. <laughs> Try and read some books. Pick up a book. <laughs> Exactly. We'll send you lists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's amazing that you're doing that, um, Fatima. What What are you guys kind of um, uh, reading right now to kind of help you, yeah, digest or escape what's going on right now? So handily, I've got loads of books here at my desk. So this this comes out in the UK tomorrow. And I just want to give it a little plug. It's called Sway by Pragya Agrawal. It's um, it's an 
it's a non-fiction book about unconscious bias. It's a really, really interesting, really readable book about unconscious bias. Um, What's it called again, Nick? Sway, un Unraveling Unconscious Bias. Um, and I also, just because I have them here, um, That Reminds Me by Derek Awusu. It's a really beautiful book of poetry about mental health. Mm -hmm. um, a debut by Paul Mendez called Rainbow Milk. And um, my dear friend Nikita Lawani has a book called You People that comes out. It's basically a thriller about illegal immigrants working in the restaurant, in the like restaurant economy in North London. It's really amazing. Um, so those are the books that I just wanted to give a shout out to that I've read recently. Amazing, amazing recommendations. Wow, you had them at the ready. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, why has Nikesh said yes to doing this talk so quickly? And I was like, okay, now I get it. It's like, bam, bam, bam. I haven't left this How many desk. of those do you publish? How many of those do you publish? I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> um, what about the rest of you guys? Is there anything that you've picked up or that you're hoping to pick up? I'm getting some book recommendations in the comments. Guys, in the comments, mm. if you've got any book recommendations, mm. share them or if you've read any of the stuff. Um, There's a great poem, Riz, which I, which I think you should read, actually. It's written by um, a Syrian poet called Nizar Abani. And he writes this beautiful poem and it's, there's a section where he talks about living in England away from Damascus and his mother would send him letters and inside the letters she would place tarragon, which is, um, which is a herb that reminded him of home and that they used to inspect his letters and they would call Scotland Yard and say, what is the meaning of this thing in your letter and what is the code behind it? And he writes in this poem about trying to say to these investigators that it means I miss you. You know, it means come home. It means, we, you're, you know, your, your family thinks of you, your home thinks of you. And they kept searching for this sort of explosive message of the tarragon. So I think that should be on your reading list. Okay, I think amazing. I actually have a copy of that one. So I'll you, I love Abani. I think he's one yeah, of the beautiful. One of my favorites. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, reading someone poetry. else told me to check out um, The Return by, is it Hasham Matar? That's very good too, yeah. That's a great Yeah, one. similarly about someone kind of returning back to, yeah, or, yeah that sense of longing. I'm noting a pattern with what you're into here, Fatima. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, what about you, Rupi? I am reading, um, I just started this morning. I started When Things Fall Apart by i'm gonna pronounce her name wrong pema chodran oh. she's i think she's a buddhist teacher it's been on my desk for a while uh, that's one of the new books i've picked up i've been avoiding reading anything too triggering okay at this time because right now you want to find stuff that's a bit more uplifting or more of an escape yeah or something that i already something that's comfortable so actually i did I went through a list for stay home, stay reading. I'm reading a lot of Sharon Olds poetry as I'm, you know, trying to write. And then I'm reading a lot of, there's this like really funny, hold on. There was one evening this week, or maybe it was last week. I was just having a really bad night. And then I just read these really funny comments. They're comics about <laughs> adulthood. Because I think I hit like I like left school and I was like, well, I've arrived <laughs> like with my little degree. What's what what's next? And then I was like, wow, they all lied to me. There's nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> and so this kind of yeah, is, we do out. feel like we're living through that moment, isn't it? Oh, like oh yeah, we don't know anything. I'm yeah. um, getting some great recommendations in the comments here. Nikita Gill's poetry. Nikita joined us earlier. Um, also, Post-Colonial Banter by Sohema Manzoor. He's an amazing spoken word artist mm. um, here from the UK. Just Mercy. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of amazing kind of recommendations, guys. We've got some Elif Shafak. Kite Runner this keeps coming really up. Too. What's that? Tell us about that book. Um, this is one of my favorites that I, I don't know if I included it in Stay Home Read, Stay Reading. Uh, Maybe I did, but Thanks. it's yeah. this really great book about, um, so Lisa spent 10 years writing this book and she went and she lived with three different women and the book just talks about desire and sexuality and what that means to these three different women. And it's just like one of the most striking and gutting prose I feel like I've read in a really long time 
uh, one of the girls or women in the story is a woman who uh, as a 14 year old, her teacher had a relationship with her. And so how she was kind of ousted from society because of that. And then there's two other stories and it's just, it's really beautiful. And some of the most like gutting metaphors that I've read. So this is one I'm revisiting as well. Wow, amazing. Um, I'm trying to just make up, you know, I'm, have you seen that scene in Succession where they're at a, a dinner party and he goes, what are you reading right now? And he just kind of makes up a fake book because he's not reading anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to kind of do that <laughs> at some point. Yeah. <laughs> it's called The Isolated Man. Exactly. <laughs> sounds sounds familiar. Going yeah. on. Well, guys, just before we kind of like... Um, you know, left, I wondered whether there was anything, no matter how short, that you guys might want to share and read to everyone that's tuned in. I know, Rupi, a lot of people would be very eager to hear anything that you wanted to read of your own work, but not to put you on the spot if you wanted to read anything of anyone else's. It could be really brief. It could be a sentence. It could be a paragraph. Um, you've all, I know, have lots of books to hand, unlike me, uh, remote control, and my phone i didn't bring anything established as the problem so i don't know if there's anything that 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 you kind um, of well i just want to point got. out that both nikita and pragya who nikesh mentioned are doing readings for stay home stay reading so amazing okay. and wait and just remind us how can we get on the stay home stay reading we just follow you on, so on you instagram and stuff it's it's sanam on instagram and she's at top bastard um or it's me oh, and i'm at, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> or it's me and i'm at f butto or you could just follow the hashtag which is stay home stay reading and you'll find the videos that way okay amazing have you, have you tried, nikesh well, you're about, to pull, so, you're about yeah. to pull out a little something yeah so i'm going through the the page proofs of my next book which is out in we're supposed to be out in february but it's now been pushed to uh, sorry, it was supposed to be out in September, but it's been pushed to February. It's called Brown Baby, uh, a memoir of race, family, and home. Uh, and I'll, I'll just read a little bit from the opening paragraph, uh, how to bring you into this world. I never considered becoming a parent myself until my mum died. I'd like to think there was a moment when the switch flicked on or the force field came down or the upgrade happened between the hours of 1am and 4am plugged into a power source Wi-Fi switched on. It was nothing like that. Nothing dramatic happened. There was no tearful staring out over a field of bluebells, no Proustian cake-chewing revelation, no need to cement my legacy. You didn't appear to me in a dream. I didn't read a saccharine poem about inheritance. I didn't hold a friend's baby and have that big final chorus and Barry Manilow's looks like we made it erupt in my head. You just arrived. One minute, your mum and I were getting drunk at Christmas and the next there you were in my arms, asleep. And I'll leave it there. <laughs> love that love that wow adulthood really is a myth <laughs> <laughs> you really don't have a clue amazing so when is when is this book um is, is, is it out now nikesh no it's coming out in february 21 it was supposed to come out in september wow. but obviously there are a lot of books that were supposed to be out now that are, that are being pushed to the autumn and so we mm. kind of to mm. the decision to you know like not crowd people not not overcrowd the 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 book buyers with like more stuff so yeah right. we're putting out next year but you know it's done Brown, it's ready to go. baby i can't wait beautiful can't wait amazing rupee did you have something to hand that you wanted to share yes i will i'm just gonna share i think this is the one that's probably most relevant it's just the last one in my book the year is done I spread the past 365 days before me on the living room carpet. Here's the month I decided to shed everything not deeply committed to my dreams. The day I refused to be a victim to the self-pity. Here's the week I slept in the garden. The spring I wrung the self-doubt by its neck. Hung your kindness up. Took down the calendar. The week I danced so hard, my heart learned to float above water again. The summer I unscrewed all the mirrors from their walls, no longer needed to see myself to feel seen. Combed the weight out of my hair. 
I fold the good days up and place them in my back pocket for safekeeping. Draw the match, cremate the unnecessary. The light of the fire warms my toes. I pour myself a glass of warm water to cleanse myself for January. Here I go, stronger and wiser into the new. Love that. Beautiful. Love that. Take the mirror down from the wall. No longer need to be seen. You know, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's that now a lot of us as artists have kind of been, we've had our audiences taken away. Um, you know, how good are we at sitting with ourselves? How good are we when there's no one to kind of validate us and give us that round of applause? And where there isn't an audience, can you, can you still be an artist without an audience? I don't know, that's just one thing that just popped into my head as you were saying that. Mm -hmm. um that's really beautiful and rupee is that the last poem in your last book that came out yes yeah this is just a hardcover so it looks a little bit different than the paperback i don't know where that one is amazing yeah amazing beautiful thank um, you so much fatima, for having did you say no of course my absolute pleasure fatima you didn't you said you didn't have anything to hand huh you know what i don't have the runaways with me um uh, annoyingly but I did want to read you a poem that I love and I used as an epigraph for my last novel and it's a poem by Nazim Hikmet and I think it's it speaks to what we've all been talking about um, and it's a tiny little verse which starts my country I don't have any caps left made back home nor any shoes that trod your roads and I've worn out your last shirt quite a long time ago it was made of chile cloth now you only remain in the whiteness of my hair, intact in my heart, in the lines of my forehead, my country. Mm. Oh, beautiful. So just to end on thoughts of home. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Guys, this has been a really inspiring conversation. It's really beautiful to hear how, you know, your complicated answers to where is home have actually inspired such incredible work that inspires so many people. And, um, it's really, it's really beautiful just to hear the kind of, you know, your human experience right now of dealing with this crazy moment we're all living through. Um, I'm not sure what lies on the other side of this crisis that we're all facing, but I think that, um, you know, your voices and your pens will, will, will be part of kind of writing the next chapter of what we all are living in together. So thank you so much. Thank you for taking out the time, thank you. everyone. Thank you, everyone who tuned in. And um, yeah, we'll be back for another long lockdown on Friday where we, we'll be going in depth on the Long Goodbye album with Bilal Qureshi. So tune in with any questions. Everyone stay safe, stay home, wash your hands. <laughs> Much love. Bye.